This well, meeting is being recorded. That's good. I was just going to say that. Could everyone um, mute yourself and take your off your video to to strengthen our broadband? Thank you. I'm sorry, Craig. Hey, no worries. And I was going to give you a little bit of update on the Buckeye. First of all, thanks for that presentation on that. There is the yellow Buckeye in Honey Creek, down along the creek um, uh, in Comal County. So it, uh, both the red and the yellow varieties are there. And uh, if you want to go see Glabra, Aeschylus uh, Glabra, you can go up to um, at the base of um, Enchanted Rock. There are populations of that there I've seen in the past. So. Need a little plant. I've got two in my yard. One has got uh, flat, lots of flower buds on about 12 stems right now. And if we don't get a freeze, they might actually bloom this year. So, uh, hey, but they, hey, Craig, but this is Leon. They're Thanks. slow growing. Hey, you betcha, that, Leon. That, that globular is just a beautiful specimen at the base of the uh, granite mountain there. You know? Yeah, it is. It it's reminded a me one, about, it? uh, about <laughs> five years ago, we, my wife and I uh, joined the uh, Native Plant Society to do a tour and we were going to climb the mountain, but Becky bowed out because after about an hour, we'd only uh, gone about 25 feet. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, and then also just to, to tell you about com the, the lack of importance of common names, where I grew up and uh, went to school in Arkansas, um, Aeschylus pavia, pavia um, is actually up there is considered Ohio Buckeye. And I just was looking at the uh, uh, tree shrubs and Vines of the Texas Hill Country, Jan Reed's book, and, and she mentions uh, Glabra. She calls it Texas Buckeye. So there you go for common names. Um, I guess it's what we call it, Who, whoever knows. So it's uh, quite, quite dramatically different for some people. So anyway, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Joel, thank you for the invitation. Um, as I, I think I've given you all a few presentations. I'm amazed that they're talking about high naturalists. So. Um, Hopefully, uh, I know some of you that are on here have heard me ad nauseum about iNaturalist. It's kind of my job now um, in large part. Um, but what I want to try to do tonight is just give you a brief introduction to iNaturalist, what it is, how it might benefit you, uh, and certainly how it benefits con uh, conservation uh, across the state of Texas. So we'll jump right into it. First of all, I do work uh, with the Texas Nature Trackers Program. And when I say that, it's two people. It's myself and it's Tanya Homayoun, who's our other Texas Nature Trackers biologist. She works out of uh, Austin. I work at, I've got an office in Bernie where I live um, at Cibolo Center for Conservation. Uh, we are part of the wildlife diversity program within Texas Parks and Wildlife. We actually have a team of four people um, that we call ourselves a community stewardship and engagement team. Um, my boss, uh, Michelle Haggerty, actually oversees from the TPWD standpoint, the entire um, uh, statewide uh, Texas Master Naturalist Program uh, for Texas Parks and Wildlife. And uh, then we have another staff member, Olivia Hahn, who does an excellent, incredible, uh, literally award-winning uh, work on videos and other uh, uh, productions to get people engaged in the natural world. So it's, we're a small team, but we think we're pretty uh, powerful in our own way. Uh, basically, what we're trying to do with our program, specifically Texas Nature Trackers, is to work with the general public to create more and more community scientists or citizen science scientists. And the idea is to use the iNaturalist app as a tool to not only gather data, but then also to use that as a tool to engage people to utilize it, to collect that data, um, and or, and I, the thing I want everybody to know, I'm gonna be talking about getting data for conservation, uh, but the, here's the thing, uh, this app, iNaturalist, which we're gonna go into some detail tonight, is like walking around with a nature encyclopedia in your phone. Um, it's a great way to, to take pictures of things out in nature and learn what they are. It's not 100%, um, but it's darn fine. And when it comes to plants, especially native plants, it's really, really good. Um, so it's, it's really a very powerful tool. I wish I had had it when I was a kid. I would know way more than I know now. Um, so we use that as our kind of our, you know, carrot to get people out into the natural world. We did not develop it. It was actually developed by some, um, by some uh, college students in, in California. 
Um, and uh, But it's a very powerful, powerful tool that we're gonna talk about tonight. And the way we use it is to try to get uh, citizen science or community science data into what's known as the Texas Natural Diversity Database. And basically all of this map over here shows all these little uh, red circles and lines and blue circles and lines. Those are data points or collections of uh, species that are rare, uh, either rare, endangered, or also known as SGCN, or Species of Conservation, Greatest Conservation Need, trying to figure out where they are in the state. Um, and iNaturalist is a great tool to use to help us in that process. So before I go any further into iNaturalist, uh, where we're gonna spend most of our time, first of all, I mentioned the word, or I mentioned the SGCN, or Species of Greatest Conservation Need. And so just to give you an idea of what that is, this is a native plant or animal. A lot of times when we think conservation, we think in terms of animals, but plants are out there. We have a lot of threatened and endangered plants and rare plants that we're also working to protect. Uh, but it's a native plant or animal that is declining or rare and in need of attention to recover or to prevent the need to have it listed under state or federal regulation. So the idea is to get an idea of what those plant, the distribution of those plants and animals are, figure out what their population levels are, how are they doing, if they get start, if they're declining and they get to a certain point where uh, science and research shows that they probably should be classified, they get classified as an SGCN. That's kind of the first step before they get moving towards oh. the threatened or endangered classifications, which are a lot more technical, a lot more research has to go into those. But as things are designated as SGCNs, then research dollars are often directed in that uh, towards their uh, conservation to try to learn more and then take actual steps to try to reverse that trend. The other neat thing about SGCNs, we have a list of over 13, just over 1,300 species in Texas. Um, there are over 12,000 across the country, uh, but over thir uh, 1,300 in the state of Texas, but it's a dynamic list. So once you're on that list, that doesn't mean you stay there forever because as more research is done, more data is collected, whether it's through iNaturalist or in other ways through university research, whatever it is, um, if that species is determined to be doing okay, then that species is actually downgraded, it's taken off the SGCN list, uh, which is a good thing. This is what we want. We don't want things on the SGCN list. Ideally, we wouldn't have anything on there and everybody's job would be a whole lot easier. Uh, but of course, that's not the case. But we, I want you to understand the idea is not to continually put stuff on there. We wanna take steps to keep things off those lists and, and that's through good conservation. Um, and, and certainly Native Plant Society of Texas uh, does a lot of good conservation, a lot of good education to try to help with that, 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 um, that goal of, of keeping things off there. So who are SGCNs? These are just a few examples, these pictures here. Everything from the loggerhead shrike, which is a bird that Tanya and I are currently doing research on across the, uh, the, the I-35 corridor. Most of the work is done in Round Rock right now, but we, I just banded a loggerhead shrike down at the Toyota manufacturing plant south of San Antonio because they have great habitat, turns out, for this bird. Um, but we're studying that bird. We're, we've got, of course, the Bob White has been on there a long time. You can see the, te the, the horned lizard is there. The American bumblebee is another species, a pollinator, a very important pollinator that's in, the, it's in uh, decline across parts of the country. It's an SGCN in Texas, but it's, we're trying to figure out, is it, how's it doing in Texas? So just because something is rare someplace else doesn't mean it is so in Texas. And it also means the, in the reverse, it, it can be the case. We also have a social media presence, just so that you all know. Uh, we have a Facebook page, Texas Nature Trackers Facebook page, where we post a lot of content. We do live events where I hook up a microphone and we head out and do virtual um, hikes uh, to explore wherever I happen to be. Um, and they're, they're a lot of fun. We've still got people. This all started because of COVID. And, and we amazingly enough, two years later, we still have people coming to this thing. So we continue to do that. Tanya, my colleague, runs our Instagram page and puts up all kinds of great content there if you're an Instagram user. So I would encourage you to check that out if that's the case. So let's get right into iNaturalist and Seek. So first of all, there are two different apps. There's Seek and there's iNaturalist. They're both I, they're both created by iNaturalist. The Seek app 
Uh, SEEK is actually for, it was designated or designed for children under the age of 13, where you don't have to give any information out. They can just go out and take pictures of things and find out what they are. It's been kind of gamified, so they can get stickers and awards and things like, pardon me, things like that. So, whereas iNaturalist is really the more of the data collection um, app. However, if you uh, like Seek, and a lot of older adults actually like Seek because they think it's easier, um, you can actually have an iNaturalist account, use Seek, and then you can still upload your observations from Seek into iNaturalist, and we'll show you that here in just a moment. But first of all, iNaturalist is an online social network of people sharing biodiversity information to help each other learn about nature. It's a nice uh, you know, uh, 12th grade uh, uh, sentence right there. Uh, but basically, that's what it is. It's trying to get people out in nature. Uh, their goals for iNaturalist when they developed this were to connect people to nature and also then to generate that scientifically valuable data from users and those people that were out exploring the natural world. Um, if you think about a long time ago when cell phones become popular and all these apps and all this stuff, everybody was taking a picture of what, every meal they ate and every pair of shoes they bought and their new coat and all that. Um, uh, these folks had the ingenious idea of, well, while you're doing that, why not also then share what you know, what you're seeing out in the natural world? And it's worked very, very effectively to the point where as of about two hours ago, um, there were 91 million observations in iNaturalist across the globe. Um, and you can see the United States is a big time player um, there. You can kind of see where the population centers are around the globe and, and how often it's being used. So 90, 91 million pieces of data is a lot of data. Uh, the only other app that I know of that collects more data as readily and a lot more data is eBird, which is also a fantastic app if you're a bird watcher. Here in Texas, 50, over 5.7 million observations just in Texas. So it's, we, we have four, between somewhere between five and 6% of the world's observations, I think somewhere in there. Um, and so with that amount of data being gathered by the general public, by community scientists, um, it, would, it would be silly of Texas Parks and Wildlife not to tap into this data set and see what we can learn. And we certainly do that. And that's kind of our job uh, is to uh, monitor that, to do data readouts and things like that. So back in 2013, um, t uh, TNT, Texas Nature Trackers, partnered with iNaturalist and began using it to host projects on specific taxa groups, and we'll review those as well here in a little bit. So how it works, the easiest way to explain it is you download the app, you create an account, we're going to show you how to do all that, you go out and you start taking pictures of things in nature with your phone, and then you share those, you upload them to iNaturalist, you share them with the world, they can, if you don't know what it is, and this is the great thing about this, I've got an office full of field guides, but now I can use iNaturalist as my primary field guide in the field. I don't have to have a Sherpa to carry all my field guides with me. Um, I can use that and I can always refer back to my field guides if I have something, if I've documented something that I don't know what it is and iNaturalist doesn't know what it is. But you take that picture, you share it with other iNaturalist users, and they have discussions and they can help you to identify what in the world it is that you photograph. A little bit more in detail, basically you have to create that account as I mentioned, so who you are, and that's an email address, a, a um, account name, whatever you want it to be, and a password, that's all they ask you for. Then of course you have to have evidence of what you saw. So unlike eBird, where eBird trusts that the bird watcher that's reporting birds can positively identify the bird without a photograph to, for proof. Um, this one asks for evidence of what you saw. So that can be either a photograph or it can be a sound, um, some kind of sound recording um, so that you can, they have some physical evidence of one kind or another. And then of course, what you saw, knowing, you know, a lot of people, we go out in nature and a lot of people don't know what the tree is right outside their back door or that butterfly that's flitting across their flowers. Um, the nice thing about iNaturalist, you don't actually have to know everything that you're taking a picture of. If you know that it's a butterfly, all you have to do is label it butterfly and that puts a tag on it. So people that are interested in helping with ident identifying butterflies can help you with your identification later down the road. And of course, when you saw it, the nice thing about our cell phones, 
Uh, they're, they're the best tracking devices that has, have ever been uh, uh, implemented, apparently. Um, but when you saw it, it's going to record the date and the timestamp. So that information is going to be there automatically. And then, of course, another really important thing for conservation in particular, uh, but for your own personal records, it can be very important, is where did you see it? And so accuracy becomes a really key component to us being able to find data that we can use to help track species. So the more accurate the data is um, in terms of location data, the better off it is for conservation purposes. However, the nice thing about iNaturalist is they recognize that some people may not wanna share locational data while they're sharing the image or the sound of the, of the critter uh, or the plant, whatever it happens to be. So you can actually protect your locational data um, so that people can't see that. It's not as usable for conservation purposes, but it certainly allows you that flexibility. And so what you're doing, every time you take a picture of something on iNaturalist and you document it, you're creating a digital voucher. You're creating a pinpoint on a map that tells scientists, this is where this organism happens to be at that date and time. And so over the years, we can build a really valuable record of where are the plants and animals distributed. And then as that data grows, and hopefully you know this or something better sticks with this for a long time, then we can see our populations shifting, our populations disappearing. Is there habitat change um, that has occurred that those populations are wiped out if we go back and check on them? But having those digital vouchers is a great way to track things historically. Speaking of which, if you, let's say, you know, I've been taking pictures since I was a kid. I have, I still have slides, uh, which some of you probably have too, um, of, of the wildlife that I've taken pictures of. Technically, if I could remember the date and the location where that critter was taken, I could actually upload that to iNaturalist, even if it's 40 years old, because it gives a historical marker to that particular species. So even pictures that you've taken that are in your camera, that you've never uploaded to iNaturalist, you could actually upload those to iNaturalist and provide some additional historical data on those plants and animals. So let's talk about the Seek app first. So when you open the Seek app, it looks like this. And then it, it's going to go from that to this screen right here that you see. And what's really cool is when you scroll down, you're going to see that here, this shows you that you can, be, if you're logged in to iNaturalist, you're also logged in through the Seek app, okay? So that's, that can be really, really valuable. So you can, again, use Seek and, you, and post them through Seek into iNaturalist if you're logged in. And then if you click on that little uh, hamburger symbol down there in the middle picture uh, that the yellow circle is around, this is what it's gonna open. You've got achievements and challenges. Your observations are kept there. Um, so this is the gamification, if you will, for kids to kind of have some fun. You click on the home page. This is what you see on your screen here. For example, back in 2020, here's a river challenge that they had issued out to all Seek users. Uh, you can choose a location where you are and you can look at a choose a species or a group of species. And then you can also find out the recent sightings of what's in that area or of that species. So you can you can check all of that through the Seek app. And if you want to take a photo of something, all you do is, if, and this, by the way, is on the iPhone, I believe with the Android, it'll be a plus sign. Uh, but you take a photo. And wh what's really cool about the Seek app is when you point your camera, your phone at that plant or animal, it's going to suggest an ID for you right off the bat. So this one looked at it and it said, hey, it looks like it's frost weed. So now I'm going to take a picture of it. Whoops, let me go back. I'm going to take a picture of it and it says you observed a new species frostweed you can click on view species and it will tell you information about it and again remember this app was a designate or was designed for kids in mind but it's still very valuable and you can learn more about the plant you can also go to wikipedia through this app and learn even more so here's another example i took a picture of this spider outside my office window it says we to believe it's a member of this family so again not always going to tell you the exact species. It just can't do that. Um, for example, we think pollinators. There are over 800 species of bees, known bees, in the state of Texas. And as mo many of you know, they're gardeners. That a lot of them are tiny, and even the experts have difficulty identifying them. So it's not 100% perfect. 
but it certainly is helpful. So there's, there's a, a, the best it can do, which is just fine. Then there's where you would go and post to iNaturalist. And here it is right here, it's posting. Here's the date, the location, geo privacy. Uh, we'll talk about that, captive or cultivated. You can make those adjustments there and then go straight into your posting to iNaturalist. And there it shows that you actually did post it to iNaturalist. So iNaturalist, let's talk just specifically iNaturalist. First thing you have to do is create an account. I suggest that you create the account from on, online as opposed to, you get, still have to download the app on your phone, but I would create the account online and there's one reason for that and really one reason only, but it's an important reason and I'll show you what that is. So when you open up, when you go to www.inaturalist.org, you're gonna see a page similar to this. Over here, you're going to see where you can log in or sign up. The neat thing about this is when you have an iNaturalist account, you have your own web page. And I'll show you that web page here in a little bit. Pretty cool, actually. Um, so let's say you already have an account. You can type in your username, your password, uh, and, then, and then go ahead and sign right in. Or if you're brand new to it, you start a new account by clicking on that um, those words right there. And then what you have to do is... Create a username, login name, provide an email, your password, password confirmation. And the really important thing, and the reason I say sign up on the web is that right there. Your default time zone is Hawaii. And as far as I know, this is not Hawaii. So you need to go in there and select Central Standard Time if you're this part of Texas. You're in El Paso. I can't remember. You might have to change it, uh, change it an hour. I can't remember if it hits there in El Paso or not until you get into New Mexico. But you want to change to your current time zone. And the reason for that is if you get out and participate, uh, let's say you participate in a bio blitz, and we'll explain what that is, but it's a timed event, and you're on Hawaii time, you can be taking all kinds of observations in that location in Texas, and they won't be going into that bio blitz because your time is off. So you have to make sure that that's set there and you can't adjust the time on the app. And that's why I suggest going to the web page. So here's the app. Here's what it's going to look like on your phone when you open it up. Um, the Apple is going to be on the left, the Android on the right. Um, when you look, these are your, your most recent observations on both sides, your totals right here, total species identifications over here on the, on the Android. So you have some buttons down here at the bottom. You also have this button up here. You've got some buttons over here. Of course, because they're different kinds of phones, they have to do everything a little bit differently. Uh, but if you want to observe, if you get your app uploaded and you're ready to go outside and take a picture of something, if you're on the Apple phone, uh, you're going to just hit the camera right here. If you are on the Android, you hit the green circle with the plus sign in it. And it's going to now give you four choices. OK, we're going to review each uh, three of those four very uh, quickly. But there's the camera, so that's going to be the i the iNaturalist camera to take the picture through your phone. There's the camera roll, which means you can you can take pictures through your regular cell phone camera and then go through iNaturalist to grab those photos and upload them into iNaturalist directly. Or now, this is really really new within the last six to eight months, is now you can record sound. Uh, through iNaturalist and document sounds of birds, sounds of frogs or toads or crickets, whatever it happens to be. And then, of course, if you don't have a folder, you can still make a record of it. That record will never become real usable to scientists because there's nothing physical there to prove it, but it still can be valuable to you that you want to document that a bunch of sandhill cranes flew over your yard. You're not, maybe you don't get a picture of them, but you can still go in there and document that that happened. So let's take a look. We're going to take and we're going to first look at the camera roll. So all those photographs you've got on your camera, your phone right now. Um, what you can do is you go in here and you select a photograph right there. And then you take and click on add. It's pretty simple to do. And all of a sudden you'll notice that that photograph is populated right here. Now let's say you had three or four photographs of that. You could click on this box with the plus sign and you go right back here and take uh, select another photograph and upload it there. So you can upload multiple photographs either through your photo files or through taking multiple pictures with the camera. 
And then, of course, there's a way to figure out what it is. We'll walk you through that. Here are all of the other designations that we're going to show you uh, here in just a couple minutes. But that's what it's going to look like if you go ahead and um, uh, pick, pick something from your photo files. And then, of course, you hit share down here, and that, that will do it. Now let's take a look at recording sound. And like I said, this is a fairly new feature, but it works great. So what you're gonna do if you collect sound, this is what your screen is gonna be. You click on the microphone down here, that's gonna start recording whatever the sound is. It's not gonna tell you what it is, but it's gonna start recording it. When you're done, you can click on save recording. And when you, go to, when you do that, this is the page you're gonna see. And you're gonna notice there's no photograph, obviously, but there is this microphone it tells you you've got a sound recording right here. Now, unlike photographs, which I naturalist, the artificial intelligence is going to actually try to help you identify it based on the features in the photograph. They don't have that capability with sound. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna click on what did you see? And then you can either look up, you can type in the species if you know what it is and do it that way. And if you don't, let's say you know it's a bird, but you don't know what kind of bird. This is kind of the whole point, right? Um, you can just type in bird and populate that as a placeholder under bird, or if it's a toad or frog, you can put amphibian, uh, whatever it happens to be. Um, and this, in this case, I knew it was a cardinal, so I went ahead and, and, and documented that it was a cardinal, typed it in, it found it, and populated it for that purpose. And then I hit share, and the thing that's different, instead of the photograph, of course, you're going to have this symbol that this is a bird sound, okay, in these, case, in these two cases. That's a great tool. I used to have an app on my phone separately that recorded sounds, and then I would have to take that sound and upload it into iNaturalist, and it was kind of a pain in the rear. Um, this way, now you can do it straight from the app. So let's go ahead and take a picture of something, okay? So we're going to hit that a camera on the iPhone. We're going to hit the plus sign on the Android. And uh, we're gonna select camera. Now, before we select camera, something to keep in mind. Um, you have your own cell phone camera and you have the camera that iNaturalist uses. Here's the difference. The cell phone, when you take a picture with your cell phone's camera, okay? And I'm not saying they don't use the same camera. You can actually edit the photograph. So let's say you go out and you take a picture of an insect and you look at it and it's pretty small and iNaturalist may not be able to identify it if it's a tiny little thing sitting in the middle of a flower. It may try to identify the flower. What you can do is take a picture with your regular phone and then go to that picture and edit it and blow it up basically and then save that image and then go back and upload it to iNaturalist using the, um, the other tool that I showed you just a moment ago. So that's something you keep in mind especially with small uh, insects and things like that. But otherwise you can use your cell phone. You go ahead and you take your picture. It's gonna populate right here and right here. Um, uh, that first image, notice I've got my hand in there. Um, I, used, I put my hand in that photograph so I had a reference of size. A lot of times that can be helpful, especially with plants. The other thing I would tell you is that if you're taking pictures of plants that you don't know. Don't just take a picture of the flower, take a picture of the leaves, take a picture of the entire plant, take a picture of the stem, because the more photographs you have, the better the artificial intelligence and in iNaturalist is, and then that aids in the positive identification of that species. As you know, a lot of species look very, very similar. So first, there's your photograph. Let's say you wanna take that second photograph. All you would do is click that box, and that's gonna take you right back to your camera, you can take another picture, okay? If you've got that picture, that's all you need, then you can click on what did you see? It's going to actually give you suggestions, okay? And you'll notice it says here, we're pretty sure this is in the genus Quercus. We think it's an oak. We don't know maybe what species it is, but we're pretty sure it's a Quercus. And then underneath, it'll actually give you top 10 species suggestions. So it'll give you some choices. So if you don't know what kind of oak it is, you can collect, and, but you know it's an oak because you found an acorn on it. You can go ahead and click that and that will populate up here. Uh, in our, my case, I knew it was a Texas live oak. So I populated Texas live oak up here and it's done. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through the rest of this page, this, this screen to see what I need to do to make any adjustments. 
And for some of you, you're going to go, my God, this sounds really complicated. It's truly not that complicated. Okay. Um, there's just a lot of words to explain how it works, unfortunately. So you've got your date and time right here. So now you know when it was recorded, when it was observed. Here is your um, accuracy. This is for conservation purposes, very, very important. For our purposes, we like to have things within 500 meters of where they were actually photographed, okay? You'll notice that the accuracy here is 128 millimeters on the iPhone and the same plant on the Android, the accuracy is six. Both of those are acceptable, but it isn't amazing that you're standing, you didn't move, took the same picture of the same plant with two different phones and the accuracy is that far off. That's all about satellites. Okay, so that's why we kind of check it. But let's say you wanted to be more accurate than 128 meters. You would just click on this symbol here and it would open up a screen and that would show you the location. So you can either use the satellite image, which I kind of prefer, or you can use the map image and then you can take your finger and thumb and pinch that, move it around and put it right where you want it to, to tighten up the accuracy or to widen it out if you're trying not to show exactly the same point. And then of course you hit save um, and that will take you right back to the screen. Here's geo privacy. You would open that up most, it defaults to open, which means that everybody, not only can everybody see the picture, everybody can see the exact location on the map. But let's say you you have a ranch and you have a population of uh, Texas horned lizards and you don't wanna share the exact location with the world, maybe with scientists, but not the world. Um, you can actually protect the. You can actually protect those locations from the general public, who ha might have somebody out there that's looking to come onto your property and and uh, steal those 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 lizards. So to do that, when you click on that, you're going to have three choices: open, obscured, and private. Again, open means everybody can see the coordinates. Obscured means that it draws a 22 by 22 kilometer box around that area, and it puts a random dot. That's what people on the map are going to see does not show the exact location. So you can protect it that way. Trusted users and trusted project curators of projects that you've joined, that you say, yep, you can see my coordinates. They can see it, but the general public cannot. And if you want to hide that completely so the map shows nothing, you can select private. And again, let's say you join one of our projects. We'll, you're assuming that we have trusted people. We'll be able to see the coordinates, but the general public won't be able to see anything. And in fact, and then, and then uh, also captive versus cultivated. And this is important, especially if you think about the gardens that you all monitor and, and support and grow things in, um, certainly take pictures of them, but make sure that if it's been planted, that it defaults to no. So that means it's wild. You wanna change that to the fact that it's captive or it's cultivated so that, um, uh, that you're not misleading the public that there's a wild population of this thing in downtown, the middle of downtown, uh, New Braunfels uh, in the park that's been mowed and there's a little box with native plants in it, uh, full, knowing full well that that is not a native location for that particular plant at that particular time. And then of course there are projects and, we, and, and we're not gonna talk a whole lot about them. There are different kinds of projects. What happens is when, I, when you post something to iNaturalist, let's say you posted something in New Braunfels and let's say, and it was a wildflower, and let's say that a Native Plant Society had a, a native wildflower project for Comal County. What would happen is if I took a picture of a wildflower in Comal County, it would grab, project would actually grab that observation and pull it into its project automatically. That's what these project down, projects down here are doing. They're actually finding your observation, pulling it in if it's within the boundary of their project, okay? Um, so you can, you, uh, these are automatic, but let's say you were going to join a project, a traditional project like ours, whether it's Texas Eagle Nest or Texas Milkweeds and Monarchs, you'd have to go and toggle this to on. You'd actually have to say, yes, I want to send this observation to this specific project, and then that will go to them. And you can do that from your app, okay? And then when you're done, all you got to do is share. You're done. You're ready to go. And again, for most of these, you're not going to go through, you're going to, it's going to be easier than this. And you're not going to have to check everything on this. Uh, but I share with all of these with you. So you know, which one is what, which, what each one of these does. Okay. So when you're ready to share it and upload it, you hit share down here, you hit the, the check mark up here. 
and it's going to share it. It takes about a minute, maybe less, and it's going to share it. Now, uh, I wish we were in person because I'd ask you what in the world do you think you're looking at right here. Uh, but one of the, the when they did the top ten suggestions for this particular photograph, these were the suggestions: American black bear, American crow. At least it's a bird. Uh, wild boar, American bison. That's my favorite one. Uh, and clearly, uh, the bear does not think that it's a bear. Those are bears. They, of course, are black vultures. But this shows you that the artificial intelligence, depending on the quality of the picture, can give you some really wild suggestions. OK, so keep that in mind. I had a, I was teaching a training workshop years ago, a few years ago. Lady took a picture of a fungus on a dead log. It came up with its primary choice of being a river otter. So, again, not perfect, but pretty darn good. So speaking of not perfect, iNaturalists, there are things that it does and things that it doesn't do. iNaturalists measure species richness. It's going to show where things are. It does not measure population numbers or health, okay? It does not measure absence. You can't take a picture of something and go, there, it's not there. There, that's proof that it's not there. Uh, that's kind of silly. The phone app, and get this real, this is just drill this into your head. The phone app is a data collection tool. You're not going to be able to go in there and manipulate the data and do all this kind of stuff. The app is a data collection tool, period. To really explore and discover what you have, go to the web. You have your own web page that you can do all kinds of neat things in. And I'm going to show you that next. Um, I will show you, though, it also has a really good help guide on the web page, not on the app, on the web page. We'll show you where that is. But if you use iNaturalist and you have questions, of course, you can always reach out to Tanya or myself, or you can go to the help guide and there, it's the best help link I've ever seen in my life on any web page. <clears throat> and I say that with all seriousness. Let me take a drink here. All right, let's go and take a quick look at the iNaturalist web page. So this is what your web page is gonna look like when you, when you log in. Uh, you Again, you have your own web page, which is really cool. There are two series of tabs. There's a series across the top we're going to look at first. And then you have this series of tabs. These are your personal pages tabs. These are the larger iNaturalist community tabs out here, with the exception of a couple of things over here. So very briefly, we're going to look at this part, part first. And then we're going to take a look at this section over here before we move to the, the lower tabs. Okay, so first, there's these things, these drop downs here. If you click on community, you can actually search for people on iNaturalist. You can look for projects on iNaturalist. You can post to, uh, journals on iNaturalist. There's actually a forum, but there's all kinds of discussion where a lot of people go to, if they have a weird question, they go to the forum. People help out with that. It's really quite a neat community effort for people to understand. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. If you click on more, the down, uh, it's going to open up this series of tabs. Uh, there's where the help uh, um, tab is uh, for clicking on it. It's the only, my biggest criticism of iNaturalist is why are you hiding it there? Put help over there to the side of more um, and uh, people can get to it more directly. But I'm telling you now it's under more. Okay. So now you don't have an excuse to not be able to find it. Um, but the other thing I want to show you is that it has taxa info. What that means is you can go and click on that and you can type in any plant or animal that you're looking for and it will show you where it's been found through iNaturalist. So you can use this for planning trips to go out and find cactus, cacti in bloom in Big Bend or go bird watching down in the valley. You can do that, of course, through eBird as well. But what I'm saying is this is a great device. Also, let's say you're one of those people that builds programs to deliver to the public, but you're and you're going to do a presentation on native orchids, but you don't have a picture of every native orchid you want to you want to show. You can come to iNaturalist, look under tax info, type in those orchids, and there may be pictures there that are that the photographer will actually allow the public to use in those kind of presentations. So you can protect your photographs through copyright laws or you can share them with the public depending on what you want to do. And that's your choice as well. And of course, there's the help button again. And if you remember way over to the right side of this, this, this uh, box right here, 
we had all of this right here. This is where you click on if you're going to upload an image, say from your camera onto iNaturalist, uh, which you certainly can do on the web page. Uh, here's some mail if somebody's emailing you and uh, through iNaturalist and as a question. Sometimes I've gotten two or three people that have written to me and say, hey, I'm doing a uh, presentation. You've got this great photograph of this thing. Can I use it? And of course, you, you can say, yeah, you can use it for the presentation, whatever. People are very nice about that. Um, or just to let you know they're going to use it, which is also kind to of do. And then these are just messages that people have been looking at your observations and confirming what they have or they have questions or comments. Uh, and then if you click on your picture right here, and you don't have to have a picture, but if you click on that symbol, there's another drop down. And here you have all of these different things here. So you can kind of skip around um, if you're on another page and you can always get back to this. This will take you back to the dashboard that original page that I showed you, uh, or you can go through any of these others. So I'll, I use this a lot. If I'm somewhere else on iNaturalist, if I quickly want to get back to my dashboard, um, I'll click on dashboard and away we go. So speaking of clicking on dashboard, here we go. We get to our page. We have a lot of different things across here. We're only going to talk about a few of them. And here's another place where you can add observations right there. It's kind of weird that they have two locations on the same page, but uh, so be it. Here's your profile page. I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, there's your, uh, there it is right there. Again, you can edit the time right here for Central Standard. You can write in a description of who you are. And there's all kinds of other things below this where you can you can share with the public as much as or as little as you want. There's that time frame, and then we also have observations, ideas, IDs, not ideas, IDs, and projects. Observations are the are the are those observations that you took with your camera. IDs are those things that other people took pictures of that you helped identify for them, and that, by the way, is a much underrepresented and a much more needed thing on iNaturalist. Um, and that's where, let's say you're a collector of field guides and you get all your field guides and you, boy, you know your stuff about butterflies or, or plants, whatever it is, you can actually go and you can help other people who don't know as much as you do because you're master or, uh, uh, Native Plant Society members. You can go and look up and do a spe spe specific search for a species that you really know well It'll populate those that have been not been identified by the, the uh, photographer, and you can help them ID their things. And that helps move that, those, those observations into what we call research grade, which a research grade observation where two thirds of the people that have looked at the image agree with what it is, that it is what they say, everybody says it is, that becomes research grade. And that's what agencies like we are looking for, our research grade observations that we trust the, the people to have identified correctly. But IDs are a lot of fun. I mean, you, you can go nuts, you know. If there's nothing good on Saturday night and you can't get to sleep, go on to iNaturalist and ID things for things, for people that you, of things that you know. Um, and then there's also projects. These are projects that you can join or have joined uh, that you're sharing your data with. So just to show you what the observation page looks like, it looks like this. You can either, uh, you can generate it as a list in a grid form or as a map to show where you've been and where those things are seen. When you click on one of these, it's gonna pull up all the data. You can edit your observation if you need to uh, through this as well. All right, here's your identifications. And again, I, I have a great deal of fun with this. I actually have more identifications than I do um, observations. Um, I'm trying to catch up, but I, I, keep, I, I love doing IDs. So I'll pick butterflies or whatever else. And I'll go out and just help people identify what, what they have. Uh, it helps them educate themselves. You're helping them educate you. So you're kind of doing your mission, uh, whether you're a master naturalist or, or a master gardener or a member of the Native Plant Society, uh, you're helping people along uh, understand the nature around them even more. And then here are projects. You can create, we don't have time to go into it tonight. You can create your own projects. I'll show you a couple of examples of that. Here are other projects that I've joined so I can follow those projects. They can pick up my, my observations, that kind of thing. And they'll pick up observations even if you don't join the project. But uh, this gives you an idea that you can join them. And then you can follow these projects and see what people are seeing out there. And then if you wanna search for projects, you can go right up here, click on this little tab. That'll take you to the search button for that. So there are different types of iNaturalist projects. There are the what are called traditional projects. 
these aren't used very much anymore. Um, we've got these set up as traditional projects because <clears throat> they're a little bit more complicated, but what, and there's a reason for that. A, it gives us when we do data output, we get more data than we can in the other kinds of projects, okay? And that's what, of course, we want as much detail as we can get. Secondly, what this requires is that a person that, let's say they wanna, they wanna provide photographs of the Strecker's Chorus Frog, which is an SGCN in Texas. They can go to the Herps of Texas, join that project. And then when they get a picture of a Strecker's uh, Chorus Frog, they can go and say, hey, I wanna, I wanna share this. I'm not gonna share it with anybody else, but I wanna share it with Texas Parks and Wildlife and the Herps of Texas project. They can go ahead and join the project and then actually upload the image specifically to that project so that we can get more data on it. We have 12 projects that we are a part of or, or run. Um, Herps of Texas is really valuable because there's not a lot of other data collection things on a whole scale uh, uh, process for reptiles and amphibians. Of course, Birds of Texas is kind of antiquated now with eBird, but we still have a powerful a bit of data in that particular project. Mammals of Texas, bees and wasps, rare plants of Texas, right there could be a real valuable one as well. And then we even have one for milkweeds across the state of Texas, as well as these other projects that you see here. So these are traditional projects, you have to join them, and then you have to specifically submit the observation to these projects um, so that we can utilize that data. There are also these things called bio blitzes. These are place-based projects. So an example is Cibolo Nature Center. Uh, before COVID, they would do this bio blitz and you'll notice it had a, a time frame, October 7th to October 12th. And they would invite the public out, they would divide up into teams and they would go out and take a photograph and try to document as much as they could within that time frame. So what they're doing is they're taking a snapshot of nature in that time and place um, right there so they can get an idea of what's happening, okay? So a bio blitz is really kind of a lot of fun. Um, there are different kinds of bio blitz that are done all over the world, including here in Texas. One that we have each fall is called the Texas Pollinator Bio Blitz. This is last year's uh, uh, event. It ran from October 1st to October 17th. I'm sure we'll be doing it again. This is where we're encouraging people across the state of Texas to get out and take pictures of pollinators and the flowers that they're on. Um, and what that does is every once in a while we find some species that are SGCN that people may not even know are an SGCN but we can gather data from that. You can see Jay Cochran down there had the most observations and the most species. So Jay Cochran was really into this, obviously. You'll also notice that in last year, the monarch butterfly, the reason we do this in the fall is to try to track their migration through this project, had the most observations, over a thousand of them uh, that were monarch butterflies. So that's another type of bio blitz. And then there's this one, there's the City Nature Challenge. This is a global event sponsored by iNaturalist. And we have this year, um, uh, San Antonio has been involved for several years. This is last year's results. Uh, Comal County is included in the San Antonio area. We had over 15,000 observations. We had 762 observers and shame on us that we only had 762 observers. Best I can tell, in the San Antonio metropolitan area, there are a lot more than 600, 762 people. So I'm gonna encourage you to get out this, this year's event and take a few pictures. I don't care if it's one or five, um, it's kind of a friendly challenge, global challenge. There are hundreds of cities all over the world participating in the City Nature Challenge. And San Antonio, I think last year finished maybe fifth, fourth or fifth, and uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston and Austin, I know for sure beat the pants off of us. Uh, they're much more, apparently much more competitive and much more organized. I don't know. Uh, but this year, of course, um, we'll show you what, when it is here in just a moment. So you can also do taxes specific projects. We've been monitoring butterflies at Guadalupe River State Park for years. We've been doing that through uh, in-person surveys, paper form surveys. But at the same time, we've got people with cameras. So we've been, we created this project. On this particular iNaturalist project, we're up to 86 species we've documented with photographs. Not bad, there's about 130 or so that have been documented in Comal County over all time. Uh, but 86 is pretty good at that, at that location. And we're continuing 
hoping to continue this research for another two or three or four years so we can get a good 10-year project in um, uh, to get it going. And notice it says 2012 monthly. That was kind of a hit and miss for the first couple of years. So it really got uh, serious in about 2014. You can also do a property-based individual collection project. We have a little house here in Bernie. We've done a lot of restoration work with native plants. I grow my own native plants in my little tiny greenhouse in the backyard. Our lot is very small. It's a typical uh, community lot of 0.22 acres, a little front yard, a little backyard. Uh, you'll notice as of today, we've seen 300 re recorded, 353 species in that tiny little yard. A lot of them are planted wildflowers, of course. So they don't get to research grade, but as a result of using native plants, as you all know, I'm, I'm talking to the already uh, converted here, but we've been able to attract many more butterflies and many more pollinators and many more birds and many more lizards and everything else into this tiny little yard in Bernie, Texas. Uh, and so we wanted to take, take, keep track of that. And so that's how I do it through this project. Pretty cool, I think. So why does iNaturalist matter? First of all, it's a data collection tool that is very, very valuable. This is our Herbs of Texas project. This data would not have been collected were it not for this project. So we've had 3,800 records prior to 2018. And then we added another 2,700 records uh, between 2019 and 21. We're adding more records this way. So we're, I mean, you're talking right there, you're talking over 6,000 records of herps, of reptiles and amphibians across the state of Texas, data that a wildlife biologist does not have the time to go out and collect. And this is all by community scientists helping us out. It allows us to actually look at the populations of these critters and figure out how are they doing. Do we need to do protections on them? Are they doing okay? All of that information is very valuable. Here's another example. So the Eastern Spotted Skunk, very nocturnal, very small skunk, very private, it's hard to find. Researchers from a university went out and they put out camera traps, game cameras, track plates, live traps in 10 counties. They had 8,000 device nights. Out of 8,000 device nights, they had 12 detections in four of the 10 counties. That's a pretty small re rate of return. But at the same time, they reached out to the general public. They actually put out a wanted poster for sightings of this particular skunk. As a result of the public, the general public, who are not, most of them are not scientists, they got 85 records submitted. 24 of those were confirmed Eastern Spotted Skunks. So from 12 detections, they doubled their number of observations. And not only that, they got them from 21 counties instead of four. And six of those counties were brand new records. They'd never been documented there before. So again, a lot of really valuable data from community science. The other thing that we find with iNaturalist, and we've got some data to show this, is that as people get into iNaturalist, and we've kind of done it from the standpoint of the City Nature Challenge, once people, first time they participate, if they buy into it, all of a sudden they get very engaged. And all of a sudden they go from, a, you know, maybe, you know, 100 observations a year to maybe 2,000 or 3,000. And some of them go even deeper into it. And they become so skilled at iNaturalist and so engaged in iNaturalist. I've got a gentleman that I work with all the time who actually teaches his own iNaturalist workshops or we co-teach together, uh, whatever the case may be. So it's a really valuable tool to engage people and keep people engaged in the natural world. And then another example of this is it magnifies the, wor the work of our TPWD biologists. In Comal County, you have one, TPD, one TPWD biologist Really great guy, but he not only has to be the biologist for Comal County, also for Kendall County. So, and he's working with private landowners most of the time. So he can't be out there documenting every rare critter that's out there or plant. So for example, in the Houston Galveston area in the 2020 City Nature Challenge, 84 community scientists could do the work of one TPWD biologist. That's a huge impact. So the more we can grow community scientists, the more we can get you all engaged out there helping us document things, the more um, get data we, gave, we gather. And then from that, we can actually practice better conservation. 
Because here's the deal. How do you practice good conservation if you don't have all the information? And that's a real conundrum and a real challenge for biologists across the state of Texas. So all of that said, Friday, April 29th, to Monday, May 2nd, is this year's City Nature Challenge. Uh, there's also the identification period uh, from Tuesday, May 3rd to Sunday, May 8th. That's where people can get on there, help try to get all as many observations to, to uh, research grade as possible. So if you don't want to go out and take pictures, but you want to help identify things, you can participate in that. You can reach out to me. I can teach you, uh, tell you more about that. And here are all the different places in San Anto or in the state of Texas that are participating. Uh, this is the largest group of people we've ever had. Uh, San Antonio actually expanded <laughs> almost to the Gulf Coast at the request of, of folks because they wanted to include all of the San Antonio River, I guess. So San Antonio has a huge area. There's no reason we can't get more observations than we had a year ago. And you can see all the way up the I-35 corridor, but as far out as wet as El Paso County, way out here in West Texas, and all the way down to the valley, the Gulf Coast, all parts of the state. The only reason, the only reason I'm trying to get, we're trying to get Del Rio engaged here as well at some point in the future. So it's a really big event. Lots of people participate, uh, participate, and we get good data off of this participation in the in the challenge. Here's what the web page looks like right now. When I printed this out a couple hours ago, we were 44 days, seven hours, 37 minutes, and 53 seconds from going. Um, so we're excited to get that thing going. And lastly, and I know my time is about up, um, I want to mention the Amer Recovering America's Wildlife Act, or RAWA. It is a funding source uh, uh, that is being debated in the House and Senate right now on a national level that will allocate approximately $1.3 billion annually for wildlife uh, conservation. Um, and Texas would receive about somewhere in the neighborhood of $50 million annually from this fund. This is not new taxes. This is revenue from, uh, they're determining where the revenue is coming from, uh, but it, potentially it's from wildlife value, violation and mitigation funds. Um, and what's really cool is every state would win. And, the other thing that's really cool about this, first of all, it's got 32 Senate co-sponsors. How much legislation in Washington, D.C. has crossed? You know, it's not just Republicans or not just Democrats. It's both split right down the middle, actually, right now in the Senate. And they've got 166 House of Representative co-sponsors. Uh, it's out of committee in the House. It's going to be uh, marked up for a vote in uh, the Senate in April. They're hoping to have final, final votes in both houses by Memorial Day. We encourage you to connect, to contact your congressman, your senators. Uh, I don't know if Chip Roy is yours, but uh, over here it is. Um, but con con let them know that you you value wildlife and, and conservation in the state of Texas, and that you think they should vote for this legislation if you so inclined. Now you might say he's a state employee; he can't be doing this. Actually, for this we can. Um, so don't worry. You can also find out more about it by going to the Texas Alliance for America's Fish and Wildlife uh, to their website and learn more about America's uh, uh, Wildlife Act to find out what's going on there. Uh, this is super important. This is a game changer for conservation across every state in this country. If it doesn't pass, things will continue to slide as they have been for a long time. Uh, so this can really change everything in terms of conservation in Texas and across the country. And that is it. I know that was quick, and uh, I apologize it had to be so quick, but hey, time is time. is time. So I hope that this was valuable to you. If you have questions, you can reach out to me by email. You can check out, uh, Ta or, or Tanya, uh, you can check out our um, uh, iNaturalist pages. Those are our usernames. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those. But thank you very much for giving me the opportunity tonight, and I hope it was beneficial to y'all. Thank you so much, Craig. You bet. Always, no. always great to have you here. Craig? Yes. Uh, how hard is it to set up a project for your house or your it's, yard? It's your really four and a half acres. Yeah, it's really not. Because I my, like I told you, my 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 property is 0. 0.22 acres. So the first thing you have to do is you have to go on to, and I use Google Earth. I created a KML. And Joel, we can do a we can do a Zoom call, and I can we can get online live. I can walk you right through it. But you create a KML 
from Google Earth, save it, and then you go into iNaturalist to projects and it says create a project and you can, uh, the first thing you have to do is create the place, which you did with the KML. So you create the place on iNaturalist, then you create your project, upload the, the, the place to the project, and then you're good to go. So that sounds complicated. It's actually not, Joel. Um, but again, I can help you with that and we can have that done in less than 10 minutes. And you're off and running. And then what's really cool, Joel, if you've taken pictures of other things in your yard in the past, all of that will come into your project. Oh, great. A couple of things I wanna just emphasize, if you're gonna do bio blitzes, uh, it's a great place to learn how to do this with other people who may know more than you. Um, you might wanna bring one of those battery backups for your cam for your iPhone, because yes. it tends to uh, run out of battery quickly when you're taking a whole bunch of pictures of things. And the second thing is, is that you did mention it, but emphasize it. Take more than one picture of whatever you're trying to identify. You yep. know, take the whole tree, take the whole plant, take the leaves, take the flowers, take the, you know, yep. bark. Uh, yeah, the how bark. many hairs yep. there are. And the, the worst of all I've found is, are grasses. Yep. So just grasses are very hard to get good identifications in iNaturalist. And, and, and one of the challenges too, because you're trying to get the thing identified, don't worry if your hand's in the way, okay? Hold the grass, because if you're just trying to take a picture of a grass that's blowing in the wind, <laughs> not, not gonna happen, right? right. So, so take, a, take it in your hand, get a, get a good background so you get good focus. Um, and again, multiple pictures are very, very valuable. Grasses, it's just like pollinators. It's like those bees out there. So many of the bees are literally three or four millimeters long. Experts at pollinator studiers, researchers can't identify the darn thing by looking at it. They've got to dissect it. And obviously your cell phone can't dissect or take an electron <laughs> photograph of, uh, of uh, a, a three, three or four millimeter insect. So it has limitations. But the nice thing is by sharing it out there, um, there are people out there that have some expertise that will help as much as possible. But yeah, more than one photograph is much more valuable in terms of identification um, than just one, you know, half blurry picture <laughs> taken from too far away sort of thing, you know? Craig? Yes. Did you I, saw, I saw your message, darling. <laughs> okay. But I, 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 know. You saw, I knew you'd see my message. But my, my thing is, did you, did you read my email that I sent the other day about Seek, what we did with Seek? No, I haven't. I'll be honest okay. with you. I took a picture uh, at Wagon Ford and we were puzzling over what kind of crescent it was. Okay. And we didn't have the book. And so Gene Countryman said, hey, so I blew up. Oh, I did read this. And she took the seek and put it over my camera. And, and it identified it. And identified it. Yep, there you <laughs> go. Yeah, there's, there's more than one way to skin a cat, as they say. And uh, yeah, I did read that. That was actually pretty darn clever, I thought. I thought so, that was really good, yeah. Yeah, okay. good, good, good job on that. So, Glad you read my email. <laughs> I did, and I will look at your skippers. I'm going to be in the field catching shrikes tomorrow, so it may okay, be Thursday, okay. just so you know. <laughs> uh, you, He's save always me a, a taskmaster, I'm telling you. Save me a call tomorrow, then. Uh, you need to get an email out about the butterfly survey. <laughs> yes, I, I do. I ran into... Okay. Um, Ernie today, so I've got to get that out. So. Okay, just just save me my call. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you, Darlene. Isn't it <laughs> nice you, to Greg. be retired?